Greetings gamer guys and gals. In today's video, I'll be discussing my top 5 favorite Fire Emblem games, from least to greatest. With every game, there are things worth highlighting and things worth criticizing. With that in mind, I plan to give something I dislike and something I love about each title, with potential explanations, if necessary. Without further ado, we will begin this episode with a couple of honorable mentions. The first on that list would be Fire Emblem 10 Radiant Dawn for the Wii. My number one criticism of this game is the incredibly outlandish story and asinine scope of the plot. The gameplay is awesome, but for me a game must have good gameplay, presentation, storytelling, and overall design. Radiant Dawn lacks severely in reasonable understanding. Part 4 goes a bit too far for me to, dis to suspend my disbelief, and that hampers my enjoyment of the game. However, that being said, the number one thing I thoroughly enjoy about this entry is that the game is more than willing to change things up with your party, throw you incredibly overpowered units and tools to use and abuse, and gives you the opportunity to make most any unit viable. Modern Fire Emblem is so laser-focused on balance that they lose out on the fun of this single-player experience. It baffles me that balance is more important than good story and design nowadays. The second honorable mention I have would be Fire Emblem 9 Path of Radiance for the GameCube. The number one problem I have with this entry would be how the game deals with Ashnard and his epic final battle. It seriously bothers me that he has quote-unquote blessed armor, which can only be harmed by blessed weapons, but there are characters who can damage him because... reasons. Nearly all of the cast of the game have awesome battle quotes with this Mad King, but unless you're willing to divvy them up to him on a silver platter, you'd never see them. None of your units, aside from Ike with the Ragnell, and a few select Legus can damage him, and it bugs me truly. But as for the attribute I love, Path of Radiance has the best base in the series hands down. There is no competition in my mind. The base changes scenery over the course of the game, which is a nice touch. But the meat of the reason I love the base here is because of what is accessible to you. Support conversations, base conversations, hidden items, and events. Shops, armories, and who could forget an unrestricted bonus experience point system alongside management of skills? Even Radiant Dawn doesn't compare simply due to the fact that the bonus experience system present in FE10 is less exploitable. Fire Emblem is at its best when you are given the tools to bust it wide open, when you learn of them upon repeat playthroughs. My final honorable mention today would be Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Sword for the Game Boy Advance. My most vehement complaint concerning this game would be the absolutely egregious length of time you must wait to promote your three lords, and especially whomever you choose as your main lord. This wouldn't be such a problem if it weren't for the fact that the game outpaces your lords in the mid-game when they cannot promote, especially on higher difficulties. None of them offer any unique or niche uses that warrant using them or waiting for them for so long either. It is all driven by when the plot finds it convenient to give them the tools to finally reach the glory they obtain as promoted units so far into the game. Though, with that being said, FE7 has some very good redeeming qualities. One such quality is the variety in difficulty and modes of play, with Lin Mode, Elliewood, and Hector Modes, all giving you different stories to take in, alongside the ability to play on various and significantly different difficulties, makes for a heavily replayable game. Let alone the fact that there are several Gaiden chapters and route splits, there is... Seriously, no lack of content here. 
Now that I have given the honorable mentions a chance to shine, it is time to make way for my top five list. Number five, Fire Emblem 11 Shadow Dragon for the DS. This game is a remake of the original that began it all. A faithful remake with some interesting quirks, it's very unfortunate that the overwhelming majority of the fanbase didn't take to the game as well as intelligent systems might have hoped. As due to this, it spurred two terrible trends that would virtually ruin Fire Emblem as a whole. My sole issue with Shadow Dragon would be the necessity for Marth to visit every village and seize the throne or castle of every map, barring the last. It's tedious and unnecessary as a whole. I would complain about the Gaiden chapters in this game requiring you to kill off your units to obtain them, but I actually think that part is funny. It's almost like the developers knew that permadeath was a bygone design philosophy and yet wanted to force you to accept it anyhow in order to get what are meagerly useful units and items. It's not worth the hassle or time it would take to complain about such a mechanic. Although this game is not flawless, there are so many gems hidden beneath the surface that shine brightly when you understand the game as a whole. With the top five games, we may just have to bring up several qualities each that makes the games themselves awesome, as otherwise a lot would be missed. Firstly, reclassing began in this entry, and it allows many units whom would be unviable otherwise or worthless altogether to become useful members of your team, no matter what. Second, two of my favorite growth units in the entire franchise are here and in this game, and they are Wolf and Sedgar. Neither one are interesting or integral to the story, nor do either play a huge part in anything, However, both have growths that blow pretty much everyone else out of the water, and it's hilarious fun to use them. And finally, for Shadow Dragon, the fact that we can play an updated Fire Emblem 1 on modern consoles and enjoy all the amenities of games of this era without the bastardization of later design style and philosophy is astounding. I truly appreciate this totally amazing game, and love all it brings to the table. Number 4, Fire Emblem 8, The Sacred Stones for the Game Boy Advance. Arguably the best title on the system. With the most value, this is where I began in the series and what sparked my love for Fire Emblem as a whole. There is but one negative I find when combing through this game, and that is the lack of chapters and game length. The Sacred Stones is one of the shortest games in the series, reaching only around 20 chapters. My problem with this is that I always want more. Technically, with the route split choice between Ephraim and Erica, there are a few more chapters to play around with, but never will you have both in a single playthrough. There are no real guidance either in this game, so what you see is what you get. Negatives aside, FE8 has a good story, good writing, great supports, and fun characters. None of the characters are one-note awakening-isms, or unrelatable psychopaths, which helps maintain that Fire Emblem is a franchise based on a romanticized medieval Europe. It's unfortunate that recent years have seen the anime-ification of this once-awesome world-building juggernaut. But we're here to talk about FE8, a good story, with branching promotions, tons of useful pre-promotes, access to strong weapons, whilst none of the maps or game design are overtly clunky or unnecessary, this game aims to trim the fat off of her predecessors, while giving a fresh take on the games this far in the GBA era. Skills make a return in full force, some more busted than others, and how can we mention this game without bringing up the fact that The Sacred Stones has the best post-game content bar none, with unlockable bosses, 
access to infinite stat boosters, armories filled with weapons and items other FE titles only dream of. There truly is something here for everyone. Number 3. Fire Emblem 15 Echoes Shadows of Valencia for the 3DS. The glimmer of hope that remakes can still be good in a dying franchise, Echoes is one of the best presented Fire Emblem games to date. My main concern with FE15 is the DLC. Now, I'll be honest here, I don't mind DLC in games as long as it isn't necessary or intrusive, reminding me every chance I hop on that I should purchase it. Echo's DLC isn't necessary, nor is it intrusive. So why then, you might ask, is it the negative factor here? It's the price. More expensive than the base game and offering only side information that doesn't really help you. An easier way to grind, which I have no care for, anyhow, and ultimate classes for folks to grow into that aren't necessary even on the hardest difficulty. It's really, in my opinion, a waste of money, and that's a shame. I love the games so much, however, that I just had to have more. And when I obtained that more I was looking for, I was disappointed with it after a while. I do have a problem with the 30-year-old map design, however, I'll say this. I'd rather a faithful remake of this game to play in its authenticity than some butchered commodity claiming its name but nothing more. There is a laundry list of beautiful qualities that Echoes possesses, however. Beginning with the story, it is one of the greatest in the series, very well told and very well presented. It truly does inspire hope that future remakes won't necessarily have to follow the evils of FE12 or the modern series to date. The characterizations alongside the voice acting nails a kind of style that just hits home with me. Combat arts, intriguing weapons and items, and the flexibility to make most units however you like really gathers a sense of customizability to a game that was originally built with the NES in mind. Bow units being the best units in-game is kind of a wild twist for Fire Emblem. And though I'm not too big on the post-game on offer, there is nothing to complain about with the main game. Too much fun to be had. Number 2. Fire Emblem 4. Genealogy of the Holy War for the Super Nintendo. If Echoes was one of the greatest stories in the series, Genealogy is the greatest. There is something to be said about Shozo Kaga and his brilliance concerning both game design and storytelling, and how he was so capable of meshing those two together. With limited hardware, might I add. If only we could get that man back! The only drawback that this game has, in my opinion, is that the game is largely inaccessible to folks who do not have the know-how or understanding in order to patch this game into English. Granted, none of the patches are all that fantastic either. With Project Naga being at the forefront, there is clear realization that it's not perfect. But what we have is more than playable and wonderful to enjoy anyhow. The list I have concerning the good this game possesses is too great to be smashed into one singular bite-sized video but I shall try nonetheless. The story is focused on the world more than the characters and the scope of all they affect. Noble knights fighting noble causes, being betrayed by king and country, only to fight a guerrilla warfare to defend themselves to the fullest on the run. Let alone the second generation, this game was originally supposed to have a third generation, and though that would have been awesome, it doesn't need it the strongest and most important the weapon triangle has ever been. Skills are guaranteed largely and buffed significantly. Characters have potential that is unmatched in any other game, especially those with holy blood and access to his respective weapon. 
the kill counter giving critical to your weapons, classes busting certain folk wide open, roads bolstering your already incredible movement, rings being tangibly strong buffs that can be managed onto others, the arena being its funnest it's ever been, this game does the My Castle correctly. Not too much time is spent there, and if you're unwilling to sink time in the castle, you can leave any time. Something most casuals seem to forget. The game basically has a save state function built in on every turn if you activate it. Remember that the next time you complain about the length of the game's chapters. Genealogy is worthy of second place, and is a fantastic and unique experience I highly recommend to all who enjoy Fire Emblem of yesteryear. Number 1. Fire Emblem 5. Thracia 776 for the Super Nintendo. There is no true comparison between this game and any other, even on this list. In a league all its own, the best experience Fire Emblem ever produced, and the send-off to the series creator. What could I have to say negatively about this, my most favorite game in the series, and one of my most favorite games of all time? Truly, there is but one and only one thing that has ever irked me about Thracia, and that is the power level of the two big bads in this game, Raedric and Veld. Neither one break the stat caps naturally, and both aren't that difficult if you know what you're doing. Their respective chapters are insanely annoying and hard to overcome if you play this game blind. Keep six door keys! But the bosses themselves could use some major buffs. Raedric would be infinitely better than he is right now without a single change stat if the man just had a ranged attack on that sword of his. He has plus 20 magic with his preferential weapon, giving him a magic-based ranged attack would have made him a formidable threat. If the braggy blade wasn't so busted, that is. If that one issue of their difficulty was resolved, this game would have no faults in my mind. Where do we begin with Thracia and her amazing attributes? How about capturing? The mechanic that makes this Fire Emblem unique the ability is to steal almost anything in-game by almost anyone in-game is a wild one. There are some conditions to it that thieves can overcome, thereby making them still quite useful, by the way. But for better or for worse, capturing is your means of getting most interesting weapons in-game alongside gear, gold, and so on. It is a noob trap, however. Noobs and folks with little sense will attempt to capture everything he comes in contact with, and it's just not smart. Capturing reduces your stats and will get an exposed unit killed if not careful. Staves are at their best in the series here in Thracia. Preferential weapons are their most amazing and most abundant, especially with a 5-use hammern at your disposal. Scrolls are incredible, basically iron runes that can block criticals, but also modify growths and can be stacked, allowing any unit to become good, and I mean any. With learnable skills, fantastic weapons, and a slew of game-breaking mechanics, you truly can make this experience one all your own. Though Genealogy has the best lord in the series, Sigurd, and close behind him would be his son, Selif. Leaf is a close third, and no slouch regardless of the point in game in which you are. A lord that comes with his very own stat buffing 1-2 range preferential weapon with 60 uses? Somehow, even with a late promotion, Leaf finds himself incredibly usable and viable throughout the game, even more so than Selif is at the start of Genealogy Gen 2. With stat caps at 20 and every stat save HP, there being a movement and build growth, Vigor stars that let you move again, topped off with a follow-up critical modifier that can make interactions entirely different, Thracia is truly the perfect game for me. 
What's most incredible about all of what I just mentioned is that Thracia was a game built on severe time constraints. Borrowing heavily from the previous entry in the series, even expanding upon genealogy's story, yet it still beats out all of the other games on this list and in the series. Highly recommended by me. With all that being said, I want to thank you for joining me as I endeavor to explain my biases towards my favorite games in the Fire Emblem world. I appreciate any feedback and discussion. Maybe your list is far different than mine. Maybe it is somewhat similar. Either way, tell me down below in the comments. If you like my content, please upvote and follow, or like and subscribe depending on your platform, and while you're at it, have a great and glorious day gaming.